Okay, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, I mentioned before we started recording that I became a race fan in 1989. Mm-hmm. First race I ever watched, flag to flag, was the Daytona 500. Mm-hmm. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee originally. And so I watched the Daytona 500. I became a Darrell Waltrip fan. Mm-hmm. He won it on fuel. Well, yeah, he won it on fuel. Well, you don't but, forget but, that but, when you're racing against somebody. <laughs> but then, but he go, won it. He won it. That's his Daytona 500. But then you go to the Winston. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, we won it. <laughs> I was my, I was mad that day. <laughs> <laughs> Not a, lot, a lot of them were mad. I, I got bit. My thumb about got bit off by Sandy Jones. The Daytona 500. We had wrecked. We were a slug. Yeah. When Rusty, yeah. we were running so slow. When Rusty came in, we cleaned the bugs off the of back glass. <laughs> <laughs> That's how slow we were running. So, so anyway, we went to a backup car, and yeah. that was our car, Whitney, that we won over a million dollars with that one car yeah. races. And we pulled Whitney out. And I remember Dale Earnhardt's guys going, oh man, they're pulling out Whitney. And we were running in the top five and burned a wheel barren in the left front. In the 500. In the 500. Now, quit trying to change the subject. I'm, but I'm going to I'm tell you, we were a force. <laughs> we were a force. So we go to the Wild Star race, okay? I don't know what we won. We won Rockingham the next week. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dominated Rockingham. Yeah. I think we won Richmond. We won eight races. So the All Star race, um, Rusty, uh, let's see, Daryl claims Rusty knocked the hell out of him. That's what his words were. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, they just touched, according to Rusty. They touched in the corner. All I know yeah, is yeah, yeah. the next day, Raymond Beetle gave me $2,000 cash. And he, you know, so I was happy. And he's like a rabbit. He said, this is for the, this is for the race, not the fight. You know, <laughs> so I got 2000 cash. Yeah. I got a ring or whatever for winning the yeah, Winston. Yeah, yeah. You know, and we got the, we got the trophy and all that. The next, next week, Daryl won the 600. So rightfully so. Did he hit him? Yeah, yeah. he hit him. I mean, he hit him. Wow. Did he intentionally yeah, hit him? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but then but the fight was much better. Okay, tell me what happened in the fight. Todd Parrott started the fight. Okay. <laughs> so and he'll he'll he would agree with yeah, me. But yeah. actually Sandy Jones. Sandy Jones started the fight. And you can look at the footage. So Rusty's coming, they're pitting over here, you know. Rusty's driving into victory lane. Sandy Jones has his back to the car and he kicks the car with his foot, with a back kick, he kicks the car kicks as it's going car. by. Kicks our race car as it's going into victory oh. lane. He's on the right side, and he, he, he's, he's facing this way. Rusty drives by, and Sandy kicks the side of the car. Kind of mule kick. Yeah. Yeah. Who cares? But it's caught on tape. Todd is running to victory lane, and he's got his hands on the spoiler, and he's running behind the car, and he sees Sandy do it. Well, he just grooves over on the spoiler, and then he elbows Sandy just – flails him you know yeah well then they kind of go at it sandy pins todd up against a car trailer that's right there and i see this well that's my team you got my guy up against the trailer so i run over to sandy jones and i reach around to get him and pull him away and he bites my thumb he bites down on my thumb i have two pair of baseball gloves on that was before mechanics wear saved us all yeah I would wear two pairs of gloves. I'd go to the sporting goods store and buy them to change tires. Yeah. Bites down on my thumb, and he won't let go, and it hurts like crap. So while I'm trying to get my thumb out of his mouth, here comes Cruz. You know, they're watching. Well, it looks like I'm hitting Sandy in the <laughs> face. And I'm not. I'm, like, trying to get my thumb out, and his head's jerking back and forth. So, And it looks like I'm just punching Sandy, but, you know, his yeah, head's, yeah, you know, yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah, no, yeah. that's not the deal. <laughs> so then their body man, I forget his name, but he grabs me in a headlock. So we're four guys deep off this trailer. <laughs> he gets me in a headlock, pulls me away. Sandy's mouth lets go of my thumb, you know. I got these teeth marks in my thumb. Didn't break the skin. Luckily, yeah. I had two gloves. This is when age was, you know, things like that. You're worried about yeah, that kind of yeah. stuff. But anyway, Sandy didn't do age. Um, he gets me down in a headlock. Well, I'm all sweaty and everything. So he's got me in this headlock. And I got my headset on. My headset, I go to pull out, and it it pulls off in his hands. He looks up. He's got on sunglasses and kind of looks up. He's t- he's taking me because I'm on now, his Now, who team. is this? He's the body man. His oh, name okay. was Bob. I, I remember okay, his name yeah. was Bob. Um, uh, we weren't friends or anything. But he pulls me down like that. Well, I stretch away. Now, both my ears 
cut. I was bleeding on the bottom of both my ears where it pulled my headset off right there. Wow. Not bad, but it hurt, yeah. you know. But all he had was my headset and the wires, and he looks up like, where'd John go? Well, when he looked up, and I'd done, I had done reached down, and I came from South Pole. <laughs> Whoa. And I hit him right there, you know. Oh, wow. And he had sunglasses on, and I, I just it was in the middle of fight. But this is what Rusty Henderson told me. He's our body guy. He's still at Joe Gibbs today with Jimmy Maycar. He said, man, when he got off the ground, he looked up. He said all that was left was a wire hanging on his ear right there from them sunglasses. And I, I frailed into him two or three times. And then this guard that was 6'6", six, six, bigger than you, <laughs> he picked me up from under the arms and just walked away with me. And you can see all yeah. this is in footage. Yeah. That night I got home, uh, they were sent calling me sending me sending me footage so we want you to see this we got footage they made me a tape you know and he just picked me up and walked right away very kind gentleman i might say he didn't rough house me yeah, yeah. he just i just felt myself go up in the air and i'm like he just <laughs> walked away with me i said i'm good i'm good he said i'll make sure you're good you know, <laughs> carries me over here out of the way and the fight dis dissipates and all that the next day they send todd parrot home because he started it but only for a few days, and he got to come back for the race. You know, nobody got fined, nobody got expended. But I do have footage of me in Victory Lane, you know, adjusting my hat and Bruton Smith, and I'm telling Bruton Smith, here's how it is, and I'm, it's just me. I didn't even know who Bruton Smith was. I said, who do they think they are? You know, they come over here and hit on our car. I said, I'm, I'm going to protect my team. And Bruton's like, okay, okay, you know. So that's the way it was. And I felt really bad that night. I remember me and my wife stopping – and eating dinner coming home, and I was like, I just feel bad. I shouldn't hit anybody and all that. And it come one of the greatest, greatest finishes oh, there yeah. ever were. Yeah. And every year, Tom Higgins would, would write in the paper, uh, the the Charlotte Observer, the top ten quotes is Barry said, Barry Dotson said, you know, my little brother John got bit. I think it's very unprofessional. <laughs> <laughs> it's been one of the top ten quotes for years, for the All Star race. But he did hit him can't deny that was it on purpose you'll have to ask rusty yeah. and uh i got some money out of it and, and and a nice and we were the next day uh i was at the track sandy jones walks up i said man bite me you're biting and you know we're all laughing and there's no biting and racing <laughs> <laughs> and, and 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 that's the way it were we were we didn't hate each other we just you just teams we were laughing you know that's awesome yeah so you do go on and you do win the championship. Mm -hmm. Wonderful! I'll what, never what forget. Was that? What was that like? Well, After it was everything that you've been through, and everything that the team had been through. Yeah, you won the championship. Yeah, that was quite a day. Um, first of all, we kind of had the championship. We kind of had it locked up at Phoenix. Yeah. But Stanton Barrett hit us and wiped us out. We we pretty much had it locked up that day. So then we had to go to Atlanta and run good, and it was a disastrous day at Atlanta. But that was first. We were really knocked off our game because earlier in the day, Childress's guy said, yeah, we're going to pay somebody to wreck y'all. And then we got wrecked. Well, there was talk at, at Phoenix. Barry was adamant that Richard Childress has got – that they'd yeah. done that on purpose. He was believing. I said, Barry, there ain't no way. Why would they say that to us, and why did it happen? Yeah. You know, and he was – and everybody was saying, don't say that, don't say that. But he was, he was adamant that they wrecked – we got wrecked on purpose because it, it looked like it. You know, you go in the corner and, and Rusty's over here passing a lap car and Rusty lets off and he just drives into him and you know, we finish the race. But it was it was late in the race. We were dominating the race, going to win it. So, you know, go figure. But Atlanta, we felt confident. Uh, I was in charge of all the radios with racing radios. I, You know, here I do deals today like a, a, a NASCAR team for Universal Technical Institute and I treat all, I work with all our sponsors. Even then, I got us free radios because we run a racing radio sticker on the car. But I went to them during the week. We all got down there early, and I said, let's change our frequency. They told me we could. So when the race started, nobody could hear us. Earnhardt, nobody knew where we were. Wow. Because we changed the total frequency on every radio. You know, that's how much we were thinking. Yeah. And they were panicking because nobody nobody could hear us or find us. It took them halfway in the race to find us and talk to us. I wore a camera, you know, to change tires. Everything started off disastrous. I said, take this camera off. I'm thinking about this camera. I got it off. We run 100 laps on 
four tires. A hundred laps in, the left rear tire came loose, and we lost a lap. We came in, and that tire was doing like this, like almost come off the car. Yeah. It's a miracle the studs weren't broken and worn out and things like that. Just a miracle that that didn't happen. That's me kicking here. Yeah. Um, so I thought I had lost us a championship, and Barry said, but that tire was tight for a hundred laps, John. Something worked it loose. Yeah. The morning of the race, Barry kept saying, your gun don't sound like Jimmy's. Your gun don't sound like... I said, but my gun works, Barry. He made me change guns that day. So I had a new gun I wasn't used to. Didn't know how tight to... I didn't yeah, want to do yeah, it. Yeah. I've never forgiven him for that, even though he's passed yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. He shouldn't have done that to me. So you just put all that together. You know, it was disastrous. We we had to finish 19th or better. I think we finished 16th, something, yeah, yeah. to win the championship. But when we, I thought I had let us all down because my tire came loose. And you can watch footage of that. I sat on the wall and cried for five minutes. And I, I could see my friends around me saying, it's all right, you won it. I just, thinking about it today, I thought I have lost this championship with a loose wheel. Yeah. And uh, we gained our lap back and, you know, no caution came out and we were able to able to win it. But it was, it was some, I'll never, ever forget it, you know. And then once you won it, man, I just remember, you know, we had a party that night in Atlanta, yeah. um, uh, just riding home the next day with my mom and dad and my wife, Kelly, just this peace. And I don't know how to explain it. Words can't really explain it of how gratifying it is. You got your wife here supporting you, how much you sacrificed, how many years it took. And then you're thinking, we're going to do this again. You know, yeah. uh, it, it, it takes a lot and everybody sacrifices, but you, you also got to really want that kind of stuff, you know. Moving ahead a little bit, you go through 90. 90 was not a good season. Barry winds up going to Team 3, and you wind up with you, him. You went with him. I actually how, how difficult was that to leave yeah. and, and move somewhere else? Well, Barry didn't really think. You know, he, he was convinced that we could take a driver and we could be like Rusty. And that wasn't to be. Yeah. All the great drivers make everybody else great. Yeah. You know, great drivers has made great crew chiefs. Um, so, you know, being nursed by these guys from Team 3, you can come over here and start your own team. Mickey Gibbs will be your driver. All that turned out to be just terrible. Um, but he didn't want to go with Rusty because he didn't want to have all this structure and give Rusty all this say-so. You know, he said, we'll, we'll, we'll work ourselves to death. I got no more power to run the team so let jimmy go be the crew chief and harold they didn't last long at all and that's what happened he yeah. was right <clears throat> about that um but it was you know going there and starting this team then halfway through the year or the next year they're using somebody else's money they end up going to jail <laughs> kenny wallace was going to come and bring dirt devil he pulls out you know then we end up going to, to wickham and all that uh but i will say in 90 we run the miller genuine draft car I left about a little halfway through the season. Barry said, we got to get ready. we got to start getting ready for Team 3 and Mickey Gibbs. He said, why don't you go on and leave the team and start our team? And I started it out here on 150 right past Big Daddy's in those metal buildings. I built the Daytona 500 car, and that picture right there is me building the Daytona 500 car in that room by myself every day. And then I'll change tires for Rusty on the weekends. I would still be our tire changer. So then feelings started in 90, uh, you know, when it was pretty much said Barry's like, I'm going over here. And him and Rusty remained great friends. Even Rusty hired him back to yeah. be Stevens crew chief, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, then it started getting a little bit, well, Jimmy and Rusty's going here. Barry and his brothers are going here. You know, so we started falling off. Well, Barry, Barry's like, just don't even come change tires anymore. You know, we're, we're done here. So I'm over there, probably missed two or three races, and Alan Kowicki calls me. And he says, I've lost my tire changer. Would you change tires for my team the last three races of the year? 90. And 90. 90. Yeah. And 90 in the, in the Z-Rex car. And I'm like, sure. Okay, I want you to come over here and try out. <laughs> <laughs> so here I have five-time all-pro tire yeah, changer. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. that was Kowicki. Yeah. And he's like, come try out. And I'm like, really? Yep have to drive down to the speedway he's behind the speedway you know charlotte speedway where his shop was they had a pit crew pit stop thing set up a bunch of tires glued up i'm like okay i put on my knee pads and they run around and change front tire you know 
I run around, pop it off, change it, drop a jack. He's like, okay, we're good. I'm like, you know, okay. But I, that's yeah, just yeah. the way Alan Kulwicky was. He run every minute piece of his race team. And um, I ended up changing tires for him for the last three races of the year. Uh, Phoenix, Rockingham, Atlanta. Yeah. Atlanta is when we were pitting beside of Bill Elliott. And Ricky Rudd spun. He had he put double <clears throat> dual master cylinders on his car. wasn't used to it. Locked the brakes up. Pit roads angled, and that's when he spun around, spun around, and it killed Michael Rich. Yeah. And I was there, and I was watching this because here come Kawhi. He was coming, and I was like, "This is happening." I said, and I hollered. I remember I was standing on pit road, and I was hollering. You know, it was a useless holler. And I was like, watch out, watch out. You know, and I knew Mike was changing tires. You know, that was unfortunate. Mashed him. And you can see me in the video jump up on pit wall backwards. And I didn't even know where pit wall was. I, this just instinct. And I started running backwards and jumped on the wall backwards and landed on my, you know, got up on my feet. And then this devastating wreck. And we all got there and tried to help and save him and knocked him under the car. And I'm a rear tire changer like Michael Rich. I did not want to change tires ever again after I saw that. And it wasn't long that I quit doing it. I went to front tire, you know, when we started the other team, but uh, um, I was like, I don't want to do this. Not like this. I, it's all fun and games when somebody gets hurt. But anyway, I was at that race for Cole Wickey. Still, still think about him and that day and how bad it was, you know. So you 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 mentioned earlier that you you and Barry kind of split at one point, and you went to Sabco. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like working with Kyle again? Oh, it was great. It was great. Uh, we had Team Three, then Team Three shut the doors. Then we went to Whitcomb Racing with Derek Cope. He hired the whole all of us and fired the whole team and hired our our whole team. There a season, then they went broke, and I remember Barry coming out here like they're gonna shut the doors. We're shutting the doors. What are we going to do? I got to get everybody jobs. He didn't know it. Yeah. He was tough to work for when your family, as I said, you don't hold anything back. I was, I was in the process of building a Daytona car. Derek Cope had asked me to, he said, Hey, you want to come just build bodies for me? And he's trying to start a business. He loved my work. Uh, and I'd already been talking to Robin Pemberton because that's when they went testing at Daytona and they wrecked that van and hurt a bunch of people. So they had people with broken legs and arms and, uh, you know, and they needed people. So I called Robin and I didn't ever tell Barry, but I, I told him, I said, I think I can go over to Sabco. They don't have, you know, and I called Robin. I said, Hey, I can come. He said, what about your brother? I said, it won't be a problem. Yeah. So I went and Felix told him, I'd told Felix years ago, and this is the mind of Felix Sabatis. He, uh, Robin said, well, he said, I, I can maybe get John Dotson to come change tires. And, and, and Felix said, he told me years ago, that if he that he would love to work for me, hire John. He's got a memory like an elephant, yeah. you know. And uh, we still have this great relationship, Felix and I. Um, so I went over there, and then Kyle, we grew up, you know. Kyle loved me. Kyle would come in the shop, and me and him was sitting talking. And everybody's like, "What the heck's Kyle talked to John about family?" Yeah. So so I'll, I'll explain that a little bit to you. But um, Barry's wife, let's see. Richard Petty's brother-in-law, Linda's brother, yeah. Randy Owens, right. was killed at Talladega when a bottle, a yeah. water bottle blew up, yeah. water tank. That was Barry's best friend. They were best friends when he worked at Petty's. Barry married Jan Owens, Randy's wife. After Randy got killed, no kidding. he yeah. married Jan yeah. and adopted Travis and Trent Owens. Trent's a crew chief today. Yeah. Travis is up at Richard Childress Racing. has been a car chief in years. He adopted them. So that became my niece and nephew and Richard Petty's niece and nephew. Okay? Then Barry and Jan had two more children, Trey and Tia. Yeah. Trey and Tia got killed as teenagers at Darlington. Yeah. They were half brothers to Travis and Trent, so I, you know, that was also Richard, Richard Petty's niece and nephew. So me and Richard are uncles yeah. to these kids. So Kyle's that were basically extended family. So when Kyle would come in the shop, 
he would talk family with me. Hey, what's going on? Just like I said, yeah. family dynamics. Yeah. Hey, why are they split up? Or what? You know, Barry and Jan <laughs> yeah, married yeah. twice. Yeah. Uh, but when you lose children like that, it was there's no more darkness than than lose. I don't even know how to explain it, but it was terrible. You didn't know how the sun was coming up the next day. You really didn't. And um, so you know, we go back to those dynamics. Then Kyle loses Adam. You know, so me and him still talk to this day. We talked at Martinsville. We don't talk about that. Yeah. But there's there's this friendship bond. you yeah. have, this bond. Yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, it was a very dark time. I remember, you know, we can, that's a whole nother episode of that time with the kids. Me and Darlington, me and Barry got on a helicopter middle of the night. The first person I saw was Kyle and Linda come in the house and me, just me and Barry's in this house. They're gone in the middle of the night. Kyle's like, here's money. That's all I know to do is give you money to help with this. Yeah, yeah that's the bond that you have in, in the care. You know, and it devastated me when Adam passed. It was just terrible. I was going to ask about Trey and Tia, and mm -hmm. I don't. Well, we can. I, ha, he never got over I that. I can't even begin to imagine. Mm -mm, mm -mm. It was I, the phone rung. Um, it was Thanksgiving, so it was Thanksgiving Day. Then Friday, we lay down and go to bed. The phone rung at three in the morning, and uh, you know, I'm in bed. The phone's over here. It rung once. And I was out of bed and picked it up because you know something's wrong at three in the morning. Yeah. And it was Barry, and he was just screaming, just screaming in the phone. He lived over here on the, on the lake. I'm on this side of Mooresville. And just trying to tell me what happened, I could gather they've been in a wreck. Trey's still alive. Yeah. I've got the helicopter come get me. So Felix, he'd done had the you know the mind to to call the helicopter <clears throat> pilot. They were waiting on us at Charlotte. We called. We called Trent Owens, his their half brother. He was uh, he ran the petty driving experience. He was living in a condo to racetrack. He met us at the airport, and we all got on the helicopter. Before we got on the helicopter, I called my wife Kelly back at home, and she told me from the airport, no cell phones. She said that she knew that Tia didn't make it. She had done got a call and knew it. Well, I knew that no Trey didn't make it. We knew that Tia had yeah. died in the wreck. Well, I had to tell Barry that somehow. Well, we got all the way on the helicopter ride. There was a car waiting on us. When we got to the house or the hospital, the sun was coming up. Yeah. Trent, I told him at the airport, I said, Trent, they're both gone. And I remember him just laying in the helicopter just crying, you know, just, and he didn't, I said, but I ain't told Barry. The whole ride down there, I kept thinking, how am I going to tell him? How am I going to say this to Barry? Because he'll think bad of me the rest of my life. Yeah. Or think something. And when we were walking into the hospital, I just grabbed him and turned him from the door. And I said, he didn't make it, Barry. Because he thinks we're going in there. And, yeah. and it was bad. And then, and then you, you, know, you know, they were divorced. They were living down there. He was living up here. Um, just a dog. I know it. You know, it, affect, it affects so many people, yeah. so much yeah. in the family. And her, Jan, just uh, she lost a husband at race, and she'd lost two children. You know, uh, just think about you know their shoes. I don't know how they feel. I've got my children, um, but it is a dark, dark time. Dark time. <clears throat> Again, I don't know how to ask the question, but yeah. then then we lost Barry in 2017. Mm -hmm. Can can the impact that that had on you be measured? Because obviously you you guys were a pretty tight family. Mm -hmm. Well, well, you know, uh, it, it, you don't want to compare. Yeah. You can't compare. We lost our mom and dad six yeah, months yeah. apart. You know how old people are in this world. How they're the scars that old people wear. Yeah. You know, and how they they're just tough. Look at the loss they've been through. When you've been through losing two teenage kids with their life ahead of them, yeah. I don't want to say it doesn't get much worse because it can always be worse. Uh, but Barry never got over that. It's almost like he wanted to be with them. You know, he had a lot of issues and problems. Uh, you know, they weren't together to start with, so we don't want to get in that. But he, he just longed to be with them. Yeah. So, you know. No matter how much you want to help someone, or you try. They gotta, they gotta be. 
they got to be in the mindset of where they want to be. And, uh, you know, it's, it was, it's tough, tough to lose him, a sibling. Um, but he just, he just never really got over it. Never did. So 1994, 95, the rest of the 1990s and early 2000s, you worked for a handful of different teams. Mm -hmm. And then you moved over here to the NASCAR Technical Institute Mm -hmm. in 2002. Mm -hmm. Was it just time to get off the road? Yeah, I noticed that wherever I worked, so I went from uh, from Felix Sabatis. um, Ricky Rudd uh, had asked me to come down there and go to work for him. He, he saw our work ethic, you know, what we could do. Um, Richard Broom was a crew chief, and I was at Felix's, and I'm like, yeah, I'm interested. And um, Barry had been, he had left as a crew chief there. That was really ugly when he left. Sometimes I didn't understand why, what his thinking was, you know, but it was fine. So I went to Ricky Rudd for a few years. We won the Brickyard. I was the shop foreman down there. But I'd quit, I'd got off the road and traveled, had children, Started going to church and raising our children, yeah, and yeah. you know, just it, it meant a lot to be here every day with the, with the kids and, and my wife. Um, um, so Ricky wrote a couple of years, and then MB two with Jay Fry and Ryan Pemberton. So uh, I had uh, you know worked with Ryan on the Melly Yellow car. Yeah. He knew my fab skills. They needed fabricators. So, but it was two years here. It was two years here. A new crew chief comes in. He wants to bring all his people in. And I got tired of that, you know, no yeah, stability. Yeah, Do I want to yeah. buy a new truck? No, you can't rely on your chat, you know. Wow, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and in yeah. Team 3, uh, I'd been down three race teams closing their doors right before Daytona. Nope. So Blue Max, Team 3, Whitcomb, yeah. all closed the doors. Yeah. I didn't get paychecks from those places. And then later on, I'd get paychecks that the court settled out, and you get a check in the mail for 150 bucks, or, you know, <laughs> just stuff like that. And yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so Jay Fry... He was a little disappointed when I left him, you know, uh, going back to work for Barry and Eel River right out the street, the Duke's mayonnaise car. Um, that was fun for a little while. But then we built this $8 million shop, and we was like, don't build this shop. Well, if we build it, they'll come. Well, they, <laughs> they didn't. Yeah, Lost yeah. millions. Robert Yates ends up buying it. So we're closing down the building. It's going into foreclosure. I'm the last one they keep. They didn't keep Barry to close it down. They kept me. Of course, he was making three times what I made, you know. So I closed it down with the Birminghams. I started having lunch with the people from Universal Technical Institute. They're going to build this NASCAR tech, which is where we're at today. And they said, here's six subjects on a sheet of paper. NASCAR engines one, engines two, fabrication, chassis apps. Can we? Can you make that happen, John? I can make it happen. You know, I was like, I'm ready to get off the road. I took a 40% pay cut to go into education. I had a chance to go to Dale Earnhardt and work on Speedway cars. But my mindset was, I can always build race cars. I can do this anytime I want to pick back up and do it. I haven't lost my skills. I got my tools. You know, I can do this. And that's what we teach today. You can learn a trade and you're not going to go hungry in this world. So I came here and this place has given me the freedom to do whatever I wanted to do in motorsports and NASCAR. So. We've been training. I set this program up 20 years ago. We've been training technicians for 20 years. I'm still the go-to guy on the race teams because I'm their extended family for Penske and Doug Yates and I have a wonderful relationship and Tim Sendrick and Hendrick and you know. So we've got guys on every team out there. Been putting them on for 20 years. Now I got people that have graduated out that call me to hire people from us still. So they trust I'm going to send them thoroughbreds. You know, you got to have a certain criteria: 3.8 GPA. You know that Penske look and that Penske attitude. You got to have same with Roush. You got to meet the set the bar and meet that bar to get the opportunities. But anybody has the option and opportunity when they come here. If you want to work hard and make it happen, you can do it. And we're that connector. So I've not been out of racing. You know we're we're official partner in NASCAR, um, Universal Tech as an educator. I get my hard card every year. I was at Martinsville. I go to whatever races I want. I attend all the NASCAR Business Council meetings, four of those a year as official partner. I work with a lot of those partners, American Ethanol, Lincoln Electric, Mechanics Wire, as sponsors for our programs. So I'm blessed to have turned a career in racing into a career in business. And the Lord slapped me in the back of the head and said, you'll go over here, and I never could have planned it in a million years. And that's how, that's how, that's where I'm at today. So, well, I, I have to ask this mm-hmm. 
do you have a course in pace car driving? We'll start one, but <laughs> I think we need to start one. Put it that way. I think we I'm need to start because I've noticed the pace car. Yeah. Are you the one that let it get taken away at Talladega no, when the fan took me. the race car? I that was, was there. Not me. I got the keys in my car in my pocket <laughs> right now. That we, was, that was I'll never me. forget how much Barry <laughs> laughed and we rolled on pit road when that guy stole that pace car down there. So, but we could do a pace car class. The problem is we have to find jobs for people who take these classes I'm and, all about it. Yeah, but I don't know how many pace cars there are hiring people out there. So, you know, we well, gotta, you can find them. You've got the Well, we got the short track. The grassroots is really there, where it's at. That's you know? fine. I yeah. can start at the bottom. I don't yeah. mind. Yeah. Well, if you want to come teach the class, we'll start a class. <laughs> how about that? You can be a, <laughs> you know, a awesome. broadcaster and an yeah. instructor. We'll turn Absolutely. you into an instructor. <laughs> but you'll be working for me then. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Last question. Mm-hmm. And again, I could sit and talk to you for hours. Well, we'll and, do it and again. We, and we already Let's do have. it again. What does an NTI, NASCAR Technical Institute, success story look like to John Dodson? Um, you know, every time that I get a kid on a team, and it's not just me. I'm just the connector. It's all these instructors here. It's all our administrative people that get students here, that get them enrolled in school, that get them in the programs, the instructors in the trenches, <clears throat> but teaching this. So a lot of the instructors, Glenn Feisty here, he was an engine builder at, at, uh, on the four car, four Daytona 500 rings. Wow. That's the type of people we have in here teaching and instructing. Now he's a manager and he manages other instructors. So getting a student here and getting them to understand um, – you know, help me help you. If you're going to be a professional and put your shirt tail in, you're going to be on time, you're going to pay attention, and ears open, mouth shut. That's my biggest speech. Because yeah. that's what a race team wants. We want a kid to come in here and work hard and show us with your work, and the sky's the limit. So we've had crew chiefs. We got 20 plus graduates on Penske's IndyCar team. Now you tell me that's not picking thoroughbreds. Wow. We have 130 plus graduates at Roush Yates Engines and Roush Yates Manufacturing Solutions. I've handpicked every one of them for Doug. Not necessarily handpicked, but hey, here's one that meets all the criteria. I've sat down and talked to him, Doug. Look at this. That's somebody you got to get on the show to no talk kidding. about how he's built his wow. workforce. Every single week when a truck wins, Xfinity car or a Cup car, there's a NASCAR Tech graduate on that race team or one or more. So we're in victory lane every single week. Uh, both Kyle Busch's tire changers, NASCAR Tech graduates, you know. Um, the gas man for Kyle Larson, this the championship, NASCAR Tech graduate from all over the country. So that's what it looks like. And I feel like, uh, you know, anytime I put a kid there, I feel like I want to race. Or anytime they win, it feels like victory lane again, you know. So uh, um, I'm really proud of, proud of that part. I got my day in the sun. I've been to the top of the mountain. I know what it takes. I'm glad I don't have to fix wrecks anymore. It's good to still be in the fraternity. And, uh, you know, I'm glad that UTI has embraced my vision of doing this and promoted me up the chain. I work for all of our campuses now, but I'm based here at the NASCAR Tech and in North Carolina and because of the NASCAR part, but still work for all our campuses across the country. And we have many students that come from California, Texas, uh, Idaho, Washington, here to NASCAR Tech because they want to get into motorsports. This is the place. Six billion dollar industry in North Carolina. If you want to be it, you got to come here to Race City. <laughs>